G'day. As it says up there, I'm Marco Coulter. I'm here today with Murray Estonian from Mitchell International. Um, this is the session we're talking about, finding the signal in the noise. If that's not the session you came for, you're in the wrong room. Sorry about that. What we're going to cover, I'm going to intru we'll, we'll introduce ourselves in a second, but first let me just quickly go what the agenda is going to be for this session. We're going to start with introducing ourselves. We're then going to talk about when you're moving to cloud and cloud native, why some of the things don't always work out as you expect. We'll talk about a few of the things that I sort of have caught people. Then we're going to talk about the visibility that is needed to deliver a modern cloud environment. After that, I'll go into a little bit of the insights around that we can, do, that we can derive from having performance management and various tools available to you while you develop cloud. With all of that said, then, Marius is going to come up and give you some real-world examples of his experiences in setting up AWS and, and using AppDynamics at Mitchell International. Um, and then at the end, I'll come back. I have some resources for you, that, some uh, reports and papers you can take back with you for when you get back to the office. And then at the end, because we're recording this, I'm just going to say, please hold the questions till the end, then we'll, take, then we'll have a serious amount of question time for you. We should be able to get through all of your questions. And we'll have microphones for you to take the questions and things like that. So that's what we're going through. So first off, um, let me introduce myself. I'm Marco Coulter. Uh, I'm an immigrant who is, who is a US citizen, lived in three countries, managed team in 11 countries. Um, what you're seeing up here on the screen, the logos on the left side, is my sort of career path. I started coding at a bank in Australia. Um, I've worked for a number of companies and have been pretty much on every side of IT. So I've been a developer, I've, run, uh, I've managed data centers and operations teams, uh, I've worked on the vendor side, and prior to my current gig, I was, uh, ran the data science team for 451 Research, so I've been on the industry and analysis side as well. Right now, I work for AppDynamics, part of Cisco. Um, apparently, people think I, I write interesting things, so on the left side there, you can see, you can go and read some of my stuff, read some interviews with me from those publications. But Marius, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you. Hey guys, my name is Marius Renian. I'm here representing Mitchell International. So we've been an AppD customer for f about five years now, and I'm here really to talk about our journey, why we chose AppD, and how the APM platform actually helps us move from a non-prem solution with multiple data centers up into the cloud while reducing and mitigating risk in that journey. Personally, I have a book coming out. I'm a, kind of a .NET evangelist. have been with the platform for almost two decades now, ever since it came out. So I've got a book coming out about how you can con containerize some of those legacy apps using tools um, such as AppD to mitigate risk, moving to the cloud, and so on. I've also dabbled in a lot of other technologies, everything from smartphone development to shader development and so on. So today, hopefully, I could give you a perspective as an AppD customer how the platform can help you move your workloads to the cloud while mitigating risk. Thanks, Marius. Um, so before we start, let me, or as we start, let me ask you a question. So who's running in the cloud environment today? Just hands up, that's all I need. Okay, a lot of you. Why are you running in the cloud environment? Just yell out answers, it's fine. Faster. 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 Scale. Scale, okay. Any others? Cost. 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 All right. And everywhere I give this presentation, they are the common themes that come through. And I'll talk a little bit, I'll show, I'll show some research later on, give you some numbers that support exactly coming to those conclusions. We moved to cloud for good reasons. And seeing as we're talking about cloud and cloud native, that brings up Bob Ross. Hopefully you know who this guy is, right? I didn't until I came to, to live in America. I didn't experience him as a child, but I discovered him one weekend on PBS. What Bob Ross does is he sort of sits down with a blank canvas, he gathers his tools around him, paints and uh, paint brushes and so on and the easel, and then in 30 minutes he creates a masterpiece. And the key thing is he's so relaxed in doing it that I relax just listening to him talking about it right? because he's just confident of the outcome. When it comes to cloud computing, however, it's a little different. It's closer to this, a giant jigsaw where we have lots and lots of choices, lots and lots of options about how we can put things together and what we're going to use. And it's not a five or 50 piece jigsaw, it's a 5,000 piece jigsaw. And I don't know if, what sort of person you are. Maybe you're a, you start on the edges, or maybe you're the person who gathers all the colors together to solve the jigsaw. 
But the nature of the jigsaw is working out what the final, by the way, the jigsaw doesn't have a box, so we don't know what the final picture is. So getting from before to after is an important aspect of success in cloud deployments. So that leads me to why things don't always work out as we expected. So I mentioned some, I'd give you some numbers. So this is research from RightScale. They surveyed about 7,000 enterprises. And what they found was that, you know, clearly cloud adoption is becoming the default. 94% of those enterprises had, at some shape or form, adopted the cloud. The interesting thing was, though, that they then asked them, well, what's your number one concern since you've moved to the cloud? And cost was the number one concern. You know, we talk about scale, but that's more a benefit. Talk about flexibility and aggressiveness, again, benefits. But cost is the one they brought up. And here's the interesting thing, that of those 7,000, they then sort of asked them what percentage of their environment did they feel was wasted from the cloud. And the average from all of those responses was 27%. Now, this isn't bean counters sort of giving a guesstimate who don't understand that you need to have hot, you know, warm systems standing in a second environment for disaster recovery or something like that. These are IT people who realize that there are machines and processing running that is not supporting the business. So that's almost one third, right? 27%, just under one third. And that brings me to Gardner. Gardner made an interesting statement about two years ago where they talked about they're saying here by 2021, they expect that fewer than 15% of organizations will have holistic monitoring, a platform that enables them to monitor the entire environment that their applications are running in. And the interesting piece of this is they calculate that all of the money we spend in innovation and code and building applications and so on, they estimated that 255 billion of investments will be at risk. So take a moment and think about your cloud investment and how much money you've spent on that, and then think, do you have holistic monitoring in place? My description is slightly different. My description of holistic monitoring goes this way. I say it starts at the application, and it goes down into the frameworks and the code down to a code level, and it goes in the, in the vertical from the applications up to the business transactions and the, that populate that application and create that application, and outside to the endpoints the web browsers, the mobile devices, the Internet of Thing devices that are accessing the application and generating you know, income and revenue through it. And then inside, through the infrastructure and the containers and the virtual machines and so on, through, and of course, networks that are supporting and driving the application. That's holistic, is being able to see that entire experience that a customer or user might see or, or experience from your business. And the challenge here is not just that the environment is different because it's cloud. At the same time, the nature of how we build and support applications has changed. Now, I've been in the industry long enough that I remember when a new application came along and we would requ requisition new servers and new network plugins that we could convert, create a rack for the application. You could go out and put a post-it note on it and this was application one and that was application two. Right. But as we've gone to container, virtual machines and containerization, and now we're going to microservices, the environment is significantly different. It's significantly more complex. And even as we move to cloud, we start externalizing things. We're using software as a service from other places. Maybe you're using third-party authentication for the access to your environments. And then again, because that wasn't... Comp so, quick question. Anybody who believes that their application now is simpler than it was two years ago? No one. I, I understand. At the same time that the application and the environment gets more complex, we have put pressure on ourselves to be more agile as we move to DevOps and SRE environments and CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment environments. We've made an even more complex environment and it ends up in this circumstance where, as human beings, we simply can't envisage the whole thing anymore. You can't load it all in your head. You can't stick a post-it note on the front of it anymore. And one of the things that has fallen by the wayside is that while we've been doing all that, we've sort of tried to stay with the siloed approach that we had for monitoring and managing the operations of these environments. A network team, a database team, an operations team, a development team. And the monitor tools reflect those separations. And that works fine when it's some critical problem in one piece of it. If a truck drives through the network connection, Okay, 
the network monitor will see that the network is broken and it's a singular problem. We're good at finding the red with those siloed monitors, but we're not good at finding the yellow at the amber. And what I mean by that is the scenario where, well, maybe the network's fine, it's not broken, there's no truck, but it's not running exceptionally fast right now. But at the same time, the database is under load, and the database is fine and it's running and the synchronization is happening, but it's running a little bit slow. And perhaps you've stood up as many containers as you can fit on a pod, and now one of those containers is under CPU pressure and you're, it's running a little slow. Each of those look okay, they might be yellow, but the experience the customer having is bouncing around all three of those things. Right? Their experience is broken. And without a holistic monitor, you wouldn't know that. You'd just be sitting around. Now, you're all professionals. I'm sure you have never experienced a war room like this, right? Where people are going, no, I'm the network person, and the network looks fine. I'm the database person. It's definitely not the database, right? None of us would ever do anything like that. However, this does happen. And it's not just a technology war room. There is also the business war room that goes on. So while we're trying to sort out the technology and work out why customers are complaining about it, on the business side, they're trying to identify what's going on. Last year, we were making lots of money. This year, not so much. Something changed, and it might be due to our technology. And that's why the holistic monitor is so important, so that you can get everybody looking, what I call a lingua franca. Everyone's using the same language, right? Everyone's looking at the same things to understand where the issue lies. Now, you've been very good at listening to me for a couple of minutes, to listening to my accent. What I'm going to do is there are a few people who couldn't come and speak today. So I'm going to play you just a very short two-minute video for those people to hear from them and a slightly different accent to mine. We see the industry is changing so fast. The speed at which things operate are not like they were even just five years ago. If you were to look at the market, the way the technologies are evolving and advancing with the likes of AI and IoT, the demand for performance is more important than it's ever been. We need to be leading edge. The customers expect everything to be available 100% of the time, and they expect everything to happen as soon as they click the button. Customer experience is your business experience now. You know, that, that's how they gauge us as an organization. Within seconds, you, you know, you've gone from having a little problem by one customer and it's escalated halfway around the world. For Carhartt, relationships are a big driver in how we do business. And it became really clear that AppDynamics had that right culture to work with Carhartt, that sense of urgency and you know, what was the art of the possible, so to speak. Since we've had AppDynamics in place, it's created a one pane of glass experience across development and operations to truly understand what customers are experiencing and how the system is performing. We're maniacal about solving issues even before customers notice. With AppDynamics, we could actually find these things faster. At the technical level, it gives you an MRI of your enterprise where you can see all those corresponding layers. We can see the cloud, we can see these services. I can orchestrate that and roll that into the enterprise so quickly. Our use cases for AppDynamics are not just in IT. We're also using it to create business dashboards and give business business insight. With Business IQ, we were really able to put our data into one platform and one dashboard and unify how we were able to access all of it. When you're talking about AI ops, running a world-class infrastructure and having customers rely on you for everything that they do, you have to have insights. The insights that we can get from AppDynamics is really key to us becoming a world-class product. If we don't have AppDynamics, it would be really like driving a car at 100 miles per hour with your eyes closed. You can't afford not having the visibility that AppDynamics provides to our infrastructure. So what is it that we do? How does AppDynamics come to the rescue of the, in these scenarios? Let me give you a, co a couple of clear use cases. The first thing we do is we give you visibility. All right, I talked earlier about the complexity of the environment, how many things have changed in the, in the application development world. So we'll bring those things and within moments of installing our so solution, you'll be able to get and see the dependencies in minutes. And then within hours, you'll have baselines. So you don't need to manually, I don't, has anybody ever set up a monitoring solution in the room? A couple of you. Did you have to manually set up the thresholds? Was that fun? No. 
Right? I put my hand up too because I've had to do it and it's not fun. We automatically baseline the environment for you. You run it while the system's normal, we will say that's normal, we have the baseline now. So you don't have to manually. If you want to set a threshold for an SLA, you can, kind of thing. If you miss setting thresholds, you can. We will baseline the environment for you. And the whole goal is to give you the troubleshooting capabilities when you need it most. How do we help on the troubleshooting? Well, that's where root cause analysis comes in. And there's an argument in the industry that perhaps that phrase, right now, that, that perhaps that phrase is wrong because it implies there is a single thing going wrong. Right? So I'm going to try and say root causes analysis whenever I say it to give the correct message of, no, often multiple things happen at the same time and that's what gives you. Like, outages still happen, but slowdown is the new outage in terms of the damage it does to a business. So the automated root cause analysis for cloud applications. We'll baseline that performance, and the beauty of that is we're baselining it on a temporal basis. So we will identify you know, different times of day because depending on your office, you know, everybody shows up at 9 o'clock, then they're all logging in, you'll have a spike then. That spike isn't a problem, it happens every business day at 9 o'clock. But if it happens at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you could be under a denial of service attack. You might have lost your network and everybody's had to connect back in. So you want to understand it from a time of day approach. And then, of course, this automated root cause analysis of breaking down the environment for you. And a key part of this is a thing we call co the cognitive engine. Um, and I recommend that you drop into our booth here in the, in the quad in the ARIA. Um, we are running sessions there discussing and demonstrating the cognitive engine. So you'll be able to see some of that machine learning artificial intelligence going on down there. So we've found the things, we've baseline, we've discovered anomalies, we've given you some root cause. That doesn't help unless we can get specific about it. If we're just dealing in generalizations, it doesn't help. So we've had to build specific integrations for the technologies that you use. Right? So one of these is container visibility. I think that we've done a really good job here. So we'll give you the container metadata. We'll give you the overall view of your environment to, so that you can see if you're overloading the container environment uh, you know, as an overall consideration. So the resource usage metrics help there. But we're also tagging the metrics so that you can sort of see the difference of, to avoid the noisy neighbor problem. So you'll be able to see if a specific container is thrashing in a particular pod and forcing all the other containers to be slow as a result because there's just not enough resources. But really, it's not an overall problem. It's just one thing going wrong. I always blame it, and I'm sorry, well, there's an ex-intern in the audience. She's not anymore. But I always blame the summer intern, right? The summer intern wrote some code in one container that's looping endlessly or something and breaks things. You'll be able to see that in your container environment because of part of this holistic view of bringing things together. The second thing we've done, or, or another area we're focusing on is, in terms of you're releasing much faster, you'll be doing canary releases, blue-green type releases. And the only way you can be sure that the new code you've put in place is better is by knowing how the old code is running. You've got to have a before picture in order to understand the after picture. Makes sense, right? It's just like, how can you know if you made it better or worse if you didn't know what was happening before? And as an example like this, you know, you see the two releases here, the canary release. So if you were doing a canary release and then you saw that the customers were getting 200 millisecond times rather than 2 million millisecond times, you're going to move as, all your customers over to the new release as quickly as you can. But you'll only know that if you have the holistic monitoring of the overall environment so that you can see that information that helps you make the decision to gain that insight. Similarly, we go detailed into the serverless APM. Of course, we're here for Lambda. We were having a great conversation, Marius and I, before we, before we got in the room. And, and it, it's a shame it wasn't video because it was a really valuable conversation. But talking about serverless and putting it in place and the sprawl that happens. Like, it's, it always seems to come in technology that we went to virtual machines and we ended up with VM sprawl, right? And we go to containers and we end up with container sprawl. We're going serverless and then we end up with serverless sprawl that you've got lots of services running and you're not sure what they're doing. So you need to be able to discover them, but not just know them and not just manage them as the serverless piece of some application, but again, to see it in context with the rest of the application. So that, because some simple example, um, no, that's a complex example. I'll go for a simple example. It's just the thing of, it's not always bad to blow a budget. Right? It might be a good thing. It might be the summer intern, or it might be the marketing team. Finally, any marketing people in the room? Okay, close your ears. So 
it might be that the marketing team finally got their act together and you're finally getting more customers coming into the environment because they ran a great campaign. Well, if you're using more resources, that's a good thing, right? <coughs> Excuse me. There are things that we don't build deep integration for. For that, we have extensions. An example here is EC2. And you might be impressed that we can you know, tell you which EC2 instances are running in which region. I'm actually more impressed that we can show you idle instances. And this comes back to the thing of you've migrated a workload from the east coast to the west coast. Did you shut down all the instances on the east coast after you're finished? You were very busy at the time. There were lots of different things, lots of moving pieces. With holistic monitoring, you'll be able to see I have these instances sitting there that are not running, or rather that are running and not being used. And again, if you're running them as warm instances for failover or something, that's a good thing. All the time, it's about the context and seeing everything in this holistic picture. At a similar level of detail is our integration with AWS for CloudWatch and X-Ray. This is an extremely simple setup. All right, you, just, you put in the credentials, you change the, change the configuration file, and watch the data come from CloudWatch into the AppDynamics APM solution. And the beauty of this, again, is that while CloudWatch gives you good detail and information about what's running in the cloud, but your customer experiences the world in a different way. So you need to understand what sort of device are they accessing from? Is it a mobile phone? Is it a six-year-old mobile phone or a current one? What browsers are they using? Putting all of that information into context around your application allows you to understand what the customer is experiencing as, a what to, as opposed to what you think the technology is. Anybody using SAP in the room? SAP, SAP? OK, a couple of you. All right, I, I won't fast forward through this slide. We're the only major APM vendor with SAP monitoring. All right, again, this aspect. So if you're looking at moving your SAP from on-premise to AWS or something like that, then you, know, you need the before picture. And our monitoring can give you both the before and after picture in terms of SAP running in these environments, down to the ABAP cloud level. I'm not an SAP person, so I don't know what ABAP means. I'll admit it, kind of thing. But hopefully SAP people will do. So don't take my word for it. We've got three more slides. Look at how Amazon thinks about this. When you're migrating to cloud or cloud native, um, you're, you may, have, have anybody seen this diagram before of the six different directions that a migration can go? It's been written about by AWS and some of the people. Yep, we have one down the front here. Um, you have six choices. They call it, we call it the six R's. Right? We will help you with the, making the decision about each of those six R's. We will help you. The actual migration of the code, we won't help you with. The baselining before and after, we will help you with. For each of those six choices, even if you're just deciding to shut it down. I have a friend back in New York who's in the middle of a major migration from a, um, a mainframe solution to a blockchain solution. He couldn't come to reInvent, and I, I said to him, you know, I'm going, what do you want me to bring back? What's the information that you care about? And his number one concern about it, and you think about it, he's going from a mainframe database to blockchain. His main concern, capacity planning. It wasn't the technologies, it wasn't the bits and pieces, it was like, how do I know I will have enough in the regions where I need it to be able to run this environment? And that's where even in terms of, we talked about version release, and even in terms of cloud migration, we can help you with the before and after. Is moving to the cloud a good thing? And not only from a technology level, but from a business level as well. Which is why you see we're doing the technology type things of response times on the right hand side of the screen here. But in the, on the left side, you're looking at the conversion rates, how the customers are behaving. And you can compare the before and after of conversion rates on websites. It's the power of having holistic monitoring in your environment. Another great example for cloud, and uh, the last one for now, is cost. All right? we brought up cost as one of the main reasons around cloud, because we're trying to reduce cost. But from the research I showed you before, people get surprised by cost. There's an element of waste in there. But the interesting challenge here is, so we're showing you here, you know, the cost of DynamoDB, the, co the cost of the EC2 instances and so on. The DynamoDB is red, meaning we're over the budget. So is being over the budget for DynamoDB a bad thing? It's a trick question. I haven't given you enough information to make that decision. And sorry, a tr trick question there. But because if the DynamoDB is spinning out because the summer intern wrote a loop that just 
blazing stuff into the database or some incredibly bad query, that's a bad thing. But again, if it's the, close your ears, if it's the marketing team finally writing a great marketing presentation and you've got customers knocking on your door all the time and generating revenue, you don't care that you're over budget. So you need these types of metrics in context with the business in order to be able to make the decision of whether it's good or bad. So that's the sort of the visibility, the vision that we have for, for application performance management. They are the benefits and needs for cloud. But what you need is a real example. And what I'm going to do is sit down now and I'll ask Marius to talk about his experiences from Mitchell International. Thanks, Thank Marius. All right. Earlier I mentioned that we've been an AppDynamics uh, customer for about five years. So I just want to review kind of our journey, how we moved some of our workloads to the cloud, and how AppD really has helped us along the way. Like we mentioned, cost is one of the biggest risks associated with moving some traditional workloads. And really, the insights that AppDynamics uh, provides helps you mitigate that. So a little bit about Mitchell. So Mitchell International, we, we actually are a major player in the PNC industry. We work with collision shops, uh, auto physical uh, damage. We have auto casualty, workers' comp bill review. We have pharmacy solutions teams. We work with OEMs and dealers. Um, and the company itself has just uh, grown significantly. So we have a lot of products. I think uh, over 32 products now across all of the, the different business units at Mitchell. Uh, like I mentioned, the breadth of solutions, these are some of the products we offer. Um, we work with um, a lot of body shops. So if you ever get in an accident and uh, you jump on an app to get an estimate for a repair costs or you take it to a shop for an estimate, most likely we are the software behind that, helping the, the shops estimate the cost of repairs. If you get injured at work and you have to file a worker's comp claim and see the doctor, we're probably uh, uh, behind that making sure that the costs uh, are uh, kind of contained and, and different laws and regulations are met as you're, you're getting your treatment and, and you're getting back to work. We started in a garage seven years ago by uh, printing and writing estimate manuals, basically with uh, information for how much body parts uh, cost for automobiles. And through that time, we've kind of just built and built and built on the offerings that, that, that we have until uh, we've reached where we are today, which is basically a PNC uh, leader, and we continue expanding. Today, we work with 30,000 collision repair facilities, um, over 300 of the largest insurers, um, and we have over 67,000 pharmacies in our, in our network. We process over 100 million transactions, and these are not like a service, to, uh, service execution transaction. These are large claims, whether it's a, you know auto collision claim or healthcare claim. And we touch over $80 billion worth of claims impact. So in one way or in another, we're part of that chain, making sure that we can reduce costs and keep uh, the costs down for everybody. We have offices uh, all over the continental United States. We've been expanding into different continents, including Europe. And our technology footprint looks like this. We have six data centers across multiple continents. We run uh, 1,300 hypervisors and 14,000 VMs, and that continues to grow. So we mentioned VM sprawl, we mentioned container sprawl, and I think this is kind of the natural evolution of technology. As an organization grows and as new technologies come in, I think this is a natural byproduct. And making sure you keep your arms around that and you manage that well as you continue to grow and mature as an organization, I think um, is key to making sure that you reduce your costs and, and reduce your risk. Currently, we uh, employ 1,200 uh, technical resources as an organization, so developers, IT operations, architects. And we have a hybrid foot footprint. That's why I'm here today. We started out with our own data centers, and we're moving to the cloud. As we're moving more and more workloads to the cloud again, uh, part of that journey means that we have to choose the right solutions to uh, constrain costs, uh, make sure we're not uh, being foolish about migrating workloads without really understanding how, how they work and how to optimize them in the cloud. And we also mentioned about application complexity, right? Uh, Marco asked you if two years ago if your applications uh, you know, were more complex or, or simpler than they are today. 
And the natural evolution of technology, of course, is usually more and more complex as you have more, more tools to work with. Microservices are an architectural pattern that just adds complexity. Whether you're doing it on-prem or in the cloud, you have more moving pieces, right? You have smaller units, you no longer have monoliths, but now they're all interconnected. And what we've seen is that you now have fragmentation of all your different monitoring tools. You need really a holistic solution that can help you capture visibility and understand your entire architecture, not just your network or your monolith or your database. You need something that can you know, uh, give you the ability to get your arms around your entire infrastructure. The other challenge that comes with moving to these new architectures is really the increased complexity. You have way more complexity, whether it's by adopting microservices or moving to the cloud, moving to containers. All these changes just add complexity. So when you go to troubleshoot an issue, you now have so many different things to consider. 10 years ago was a monolith, it was an executable probably running on a web server, reboot it, you might be okay. Today, that's not the case, especially when you're using third party uh, vendors, APIs, and so on. And then bifurcation of hosting modalities. If you're like Mitchell, you probably have some legacy applications that still run on VMs. Maybe they still run as services. And now you have this new breed of microservices running on either um, in your own data center, on either VMs or containers, or you're going cloud native and you know, you're writing uh, serverless functions running in the cloud directly. So having to manage all these different hosting modalities and you know, make, make basically get your hands around being able to understand what's happening where and how those uh, issues can cascade between all the different systems is really important. So AppDynamics has really helped us get our hands around that. Basically, it's a single pane of glass that helps us look at our architecture that spans our data center, spans the cloud, VMs, services, um, serverless functions, and really kind of gives you a holistic picture so you can understand your transactions as they flow through the system, all the way from the end user website application down into your, your web service layer, to your database, your queues, your serverless function, back to the user. So now you can understand each transaction all the way down to the line of code, how all those different things are contributing either to a great end user experience or maybe doing the opposite and you know, creating a negative user experience that eventually has financial consequences. Um, and again, troubleshooting. Apti helps us hone in on the issue and reduce the time it takes for us to find that root cause, right? The cause is, is it network connectivity? Is it a bad host? Is it a noisy neighbor? Again, as you have so many different components running together, Apti just allows us to pinpoint that issue a lot quicker than if we were to run multiple tools that are all kind of meant for a single um, style of, of monitoring, whether it's your network monitor, your database monitor. Apti kind of brings it all together into, into that single pane of glass. And here's kind of an example of what an early setup looked like when we introduced Apti into our environments. We overlaid it onto our monolithic applications. Apti jumped in there, automatically detected all of the different tiers that play in the application, whether it's your database tier or your web server tier. And then it automatically traces your, your dependencies between them. So if you have a web service talking to another web service, you could see those transactions flowing from one service to another. You can measure the response time. And with the baselines that the application creates, you could create a heuristical expectation of what that performance should look like at any point during the day. Like Marco mentioned, if something starts going wrong, whether it's a denial of service attack, or maybe a customer has a loop on their end, not necessarily your intern, but your customer messes up, right? And they start hitting you with maybe bad OAuth requests or something like that. You're able to trace that and, and pinpoint that issue a lot quicker because now you have this holistic picture. And again, we talked about containerization and moving your workloads into either containers or Lambda X, uh, functions and so on. As you go through that journey and your application architecture starts um, evolving, your picture might end up looking like this, where now you have a lot more dependencies, you have queues you have to manage and track and put SLAs around. And AppDynamics just helps you automatically trace and track all that in real time. And again, setting up uh, the different thresholds automatically for you based on heuristical analysis of what's occurring in the system. 
So you don't have to manually go in there and set, uh, set your thresholds for every single new queue you've developed or, or new service you've integrated. It's all done for you automatically. Of course, you could go and fine tune, um, you know, based on your SLAs or, or specific uh, desires, but overall the tool just kind of gives you a map and allows you to, to look at your operations at any point in time. So some of the key learnings that we've had in our journey is that um, you should really deploy this tool on both your cloud-native applications as well as your monoliths, especially if, if they work together. Usually you take your legacy app and it evolves and moves again to either containers or serverless function. It's really important to try and get apt either early because as you go through the, your journey of evolving your application, you want to be able to compare and contrast and understand Am I you know, doing something that's either making the application more performant, am I reducing cost, or am I you know, starting to create uh, costs for the, for the organization because I'm moving to maybe a modality that isn't optimal for, for my particular application. The other one I love is it really helps you go down that DevOps journey where you're now empowering developers to really understand how their application is performing in the real world out there they get the tool and they could see that line of code is either bottleneck or I'm able to go in there and uh, improve it just by optimizing it, right? So they could get that um, kind of information back immediately without having to jump through any extra hoops. So our results specifically in you know, some of the projects we've worked on, we've been able to reduce the mean time to resolution by a quarter. So we're able to troubleshoot more complex environments quicker than we were before, before APT, right? So instead of running multiple monitoring tools just by running AppD, we can pinpoint the issue even as our uh, application infrastructure and architecture is uh, increasing in complexity. Due to that, as a byproduct, we've been able to reduce our footprint. Again, by finding your bottlenecks, by finding uh, issues, you could um, go in there, optimize them, and next thing you know, you have extra capacity. You've optimized that loop or that SQL query or you know, that, that service, uh, connectivity, and now you have extra hardware to work with. And again, as you move to cloud, the benefit of that is reduced cost because you no longer have that extra waste. And then improved ability to meet KPIs. And that, that's a key business driver right there that all of us aspire to, to, to reach. And what's next for us really is we're rolling out app dynamics across the entire organization. So as we continue to grow, as we continue to you know, acquire um, and grow organically. We want to make sure that Apti is at the core of everything we do, and we continue to have that holistic picture across our entire business. And we're also, again, like most organizations, moving our legacy workloads onto new hosting modalities, whether it's optimizing and refactoring them for serverless or containerizing them and, and you know, putting them into a more modern microservices type of architecture. Um, AWS, uh, sorry, AppD and AWS are, they're kind of at the core of that, helping us, uh, you know, kind of evolve our architecture. Thanks, Marius, that was great. Can, can Mar thank Marius, please. There you go. So Marius told you what was next for Mitchell International. Let me briefly tell you what's next for AppDynamics. So we've built some really sound container visibility. And the way we got to that was through listening to enterprise experts like yourselves. But we know we're not done. It's part, like that sort of level is what got us to Gardner putting us in the leadership quadrant for seven years in a row. But we can't rest on our laurels, and so we're still working on that container visibility to make it even better again. At the moment, we've got deep integration with CloudWatch and with X-Ray, bringing those metrics into our environment. As we're improving and tuning and re having PhDs rewrite our cognitive engine, we want to move on from simply collecting the data and correlating that data for you into delivering insights based on that third-party data so that you will be able to see a conta container that's restarting all the time and realize that it's restarting because there's a configuration error or something like that, taking you to the insight to the true root causes of any given environment problem. And the third one here, for me personally, is the most exciting one because of my data science background, which is where we're bringing AI ops into the picture here for cloud native. So bringing artificial intelligence and machine learning to metrics is exactly what it's best at. Right? And of course, performance monitoring is all about the metrics. Applying the machine learning to that 
will allow us to give you not just the visibility so that you can see, you know, visualize the environment because humans can't comprehend it all internally anymore. Not just the insight into these are the root causes and this is when the problem began and this is the, the general areas, but even, or at least the root causes for it, but even to the point of action of being able to integrate into third parties and trigger actions and take the resolutions for those complex and mundane things. So here's the bad news about AI ops. If your job today is the person who sort of wake, comes in every morning at 8.30, okay, 10.30 for some of you kind of thing, and, and runs that one script that just sort of resets the containers, and, and you're the expert because you built that little script and it resets the containers, or something like that. Maybe you're the person who boosts up, you know, stands up a new container in a pod when it starts to run slow. I'm sorry, we're going to automate that position. We need your expertise to be different from that, to give you this sort of holistic information so that you can make better decisions. So I apologize in advance. If you love just running that script in the morning and think, I've done my job for the day, I'm hitting the coffee now, it's not good news. But if you're someone who loves technology, who loves the challenge of the change and the difference and the speed at which we do things, well, those mundane tasks like running that script because the same thing happened yesterday and I run the script every day when this thing happens, will never happen for you again. They're automated under AI operations. And again, I, I thoroughly recommend, we're not showing the demo today here, come to the quad and see the demo. Come to the Venetian where we have a large booth I'm giving presentations there through the rest of the week on the cognitive engine. Come and hear what and how smart that thing is for you. And that's AI ops being applied to cloud native environments. So I want to bring us to the sort of bring the story back home again now. If you remember, you know, I used the example of cloud being this box of jigsaw pieces, but you didn't have the picture on the front of the box. And you didn't have the ability to sort and work out. But the complexity is the same. What we do with the App Dynamics and APM, we're giving you the visibility, we're giving you the box cover so you can see how all of the pieces will look fit together, how they will work, what the performance will be, so you can predict capacity management, so you can see what the changes are. And one of the key things around this is like, so when you do that cloud migration and you move to the new environment, you're watching and seeing the metrics, you can then prove to your boss, this was a good idea, see, the world is better a place now. And I just remi that reminded me of something. Of I just need to take a quick photo for my boss to show that I came here and presented to you all. Look really interested, okay? Really fascinated. I'm just going to take one over there and then one over there. Kyle will be impressed. Thank you. So we're giving you the visibility to see things. We're giving you the insight, which is a bit like the robotic camera arm with the camera on it, that can find the edge pieces in the jigsaw for you, can find the colors whichever way you like to tackle your jigsaw to put the picture together. And you can become the Bob Ross for your environment, the relaxed person that is just like, yep, we're going to cloud, no problems, I got this. And isn't stressed about it, yep, I know what it's going to look like, it's going to be this great person. If you, just think if that was your reputation in your company. He's always relaxed and he delivers great pictures for us pictures being running applications. So I promised you some resources. Um, these are QR codes, so if you have a phone that can read QR codes, you can just take a photo of the screen and, and it'll pull up some of those codes for you. The first one here um, is the Gartner report that I mentioned that talked about 15% and holistic, um, holistic monitoring. Um, I recommend that as a great read. Even though it was in 2018, um, I used to compete with Gartner, so I tend to diss them a little. It was one of the times that Gartner got it right. Right. The second one here is a great ebook that was co-written by a number of people here. We focus in our documentation of it being actionable documentation, that things that you can take away and deal with, with or without the product. This particular chapter is a great one in terms of just dealing with the hybrid cloud scenario. And then the third one, if you didn't hear enough from the little video I played, if Marius' great presentation didn't sort of kick in for you of just this is what we need, there's another use case. Have a look at the NASDAQ case study. There's a video there as well you can watch again. Again, people that don't have my accent. I've lived in New York for over 20 years now. I cannot do anything about this accent. I've picked up the New York attitude. I yell at traffic and stuff like that, but I still sound this way. So there's a couple of resources for you for when you get back to the office, things you can do.